Imagine waking up to this every morning. For Big Cat Doctor Johann Joubert, it's just another day at work. This is his office, the Shamwari Game Reserve on the Eastern Cape of South Africa. These are some of his patients. They're more interested in eating him than listening to his advice. It's one of the world's most dangerous jobs, but it's all in a day's work for the big cat doctor. When it comes to workplaces, the Shamwari Game Reserve on the Eastern Cape of South Africa is a pretty amazing place. 45,000 acres of beautiful bushland teeming with some of the world's most incredible animals. It's hard to believe, but not so long ago, it was a very different picture. This was all barren farmland. When settlers arrived on the Eastern Cape 150 years ago, they started killing the wildlife and clearing the vegetation so they could graze domestic stock. After years of hard work, that land has now been restored to its natural state and most of the native animals have been brought back. Shamwari has been heralded a conservation success and has opened its doors to visitors. For the big cats of South Africa, reserves like this are their best chance of survival. All of them are being threatened by habitat loss, lack of natural prey and hunting for pelts and trophies. In just a few short decades, big cats have disappeared from over 80% of their historic terrain. There are less than 20,000 lions left in the wild and around 12,000 cheetah. That's why every big cat lion is precious. Here at Shamwari, it's Johan's job to look after them and make sure they get the best of care. Johan is on his first call out. He's with Shamwari's ecologist, John O'Brien. When you're dealing with big teeth and razor sharp claws, it pays to have someone you can trust watching your back. They've been working as a team for 10 years. I just left to load first, eh? Today's patient is the biggest of Africa's cats and the most majestic. Johan needs to dart this lioness to fit her with an internal radio transmitter. That way, he'll be able to keep track of her once she has cubs. The pair have been mating for about seven days. Lions can copulate up to 40 times in a 24-hour period. For the male, the more he mates, the more it reinforces the offspring will be his. This is the perfect opportunity to get up close to the female. She's normally quite nervous, and this makes her elusive. With the male around, she is far more relaxed. It seems a shame to interrupt them, but they should just about be at the end of their mating cycle. It looks like the female has had enough. The slightest bit of wind can blow the dart off course. The nearer you are, the better the chance of a direct hit. Now comes the tricky part. Getting the male to leave so we can load the lioness and get her to the vet center. Johan and John have changed vehicles for extra safety. They need to herd the lion away. This could get dangerous. The male isn't cooperating. He's trying to protect the female. Yeah, we we got to be careful now. He's he's getting rather irritated. You can tell by his body signs, tail flicking down. And although they don't generally um, attack humans or vehicles, 
you know, if, if, if you push him too far and you irritate him, anybody has his breaking point and, and he might charge. Yaha will have to dart him as well. Okay, Tony, it's done, eh? So we're just going to wait for him and the female is lying right in the sun, so we'll have to load as quick as we can as soon as he's done. Eh? Come, 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 Cats can't moderate their body temperature when drugged. It's warming up and there's a danger our lioness could overheat and die. We have to get her out of the sun. Can I get the back legs? We also need to move the male to a shady spot. This is where teamwork comes in handy. Lions weigh up to 220 kilos, over 400 pounds, and it takes eight men to lift him. Working with big cats is never easy. We're back at the Shamwari Vet Centre. And big cat doctor Johan Joubert needs to fit that internal radio transmitter to our lioness. Our female is only lightly sedated. That's why her legs are stiff. She's not fully relaxed. The lighter the dose, the less side effects she will have when she wakes up. We're just taking all these ticks off because we have to operate here now. Ticks on a household cat would make it ill. But wild cats have a much higher immunity and they don't seem to bother them. They also have thicker skin, making it harder to bite through. Lions really are tailor-made to suit their environment. Just look at those teeth. The canines are designed to rip into an enemy and grasp and tear food. Can we put these front feet? Can somebody just pull it out of the way for us, please? Can you take the foot properly? Yeah, that way. Just try and keep it that way. Thanks. These students have travelled from across the world to watch Johan at work. Radio collars are usually fitted around the neck. But this transmitter is going inside the abdominal cavity, where there's no chance of getting caught on branches. OK, so what we're doing is we first cut through the skin. And then normally they're quite fat underneath. Okay, so there we're right inside the abdominal cavity now. This is the radio transmitter, the radio is one side and the aerial is sort of wind up on the other side. So that go in right inside. There we are. It seems like there you can hear the signal now. So we know it's working. So it's inside, it doesn't bother them, it's just floating inside. And it looked like quite a big object uh, uh, inside, but if we think of a uterus that's pregnant, it's big, it's huge like that. So a little battery thing like that is not really going to affect them. If a person had an operation of this size, they would need weeks to recover. But lions are made of far sturdier stuff. Cuts and scratches are common, as fighting is a part of life. They're designed to heal fast. So this is actually quite a minor operation. In the case of lions, they will be hardly aware of this. Our lioness will recover in this crate overnight. It's important that she is fully alert when released so she can fend off other animals. An angry elephant or a pack of wild dogs could easily take her out. Lions may be top of the food chain, but that doesn't make them invincible. Less than 24 hours later, and you'd hardly know our lioness had been operated on. They really are built to last. When it comes to big cat patients, lions might be the toughest, but our next feline is the fastest. This cheetah and her three cubs were rescued from a nearby sheep farm. While cheetah pose no danger to humans, they can be a threat to livestock and farmers are often forced to shoot them to protect their livelihood.
Today, they're being moved into a larger enclosure on the main reserve. We don't want anybody bitten, eh? And these cups are going to run quite, quite a bit inside. Obviously, we want to try and reduce the stress as well. So we put these boxes inside. If we don't manage to do it that way, they're too small to dart. We have to do it with blankets, but then we must be careful, eh? because they'll really bite. Eh? The cubs are on full-scale alert. The fur on their backs is standing up. They use this to camouflage themselves in dry grass. It also makes them look like a honey badger, a particularly vicious animal when attacked that lions tend to avoid. These guys are fast. As adults, they can reach speeds of up to 70 miles, 112 kilometres an hour. That's one down, two to go. And they've gone straight up a tree for protection. Mum has taught them well. Take it by the tail if you can. You can put it in a box now. Okay, okay, got it. The tail is the best place to grab them. It doesn't hurt and it's well away from those razor sharp teeth. This enclosure will be their home for the next couple of months while they get used to their new surroundings. Then they'll be going it alone on the reserve. In the wild, cheetah cubs have a high mortality rate. In some areas, up to 75% die before they reach three months old. These guys have been given a lucky break. Life as a big cat doctor is always amazing. Johan is on a house call, but don't expect to see a domestic cat. This is Carrie the Caracal, and she lives with ecologist John O'Brien's family. Now that's taking your work home with you. <coughs> Carrie has a chipped tooth that's become infected. Johan needs to pull it out. But first, she has to be sedated. Yeah, my big girl. Come on. There we go. Okay. John distracts her so Johan can inject the tranquilizer. Here you go. How much are you getting? It's all done. Now we have to wait for her to go to sleep. She's trying to fight it. Carrie really is part of John's family. She arrived at Shamwari when she was 10 months old. She'd been hand raised by a farmer, but became too much to handle. John agreed to look after her and try to get her back to the wild. Caracals are amazing hunters. They can leap high into the sky. At one point in history, they were used in pigeon catching competitions and could bag up to 12 birds at a time. The good news is, Carrie is starting to spend more time outdoors and John is hopeful one day she will go it alone. When she does, she won't have a painful tooth to worry about. For a carnivore, the teeth are one of the most important parts of the body. The problem is it's a very big tooth with very big roots. It's sometimes very difficult to get it out. It's quite possible that we might break the tooth. Eh? Luckily, it's not a canine. These are vital for hunting and fighting. Teeth are very brittle, eh? There's a lot of pus. This is a really bad infection. It must have been so painful. A cat's mouth is unique. It's rigid and can't move its lower jaw sideways or grind its teeth. They have to tear or crush their food. Most of it's swallowed whole and their digestive juices break it down. Open from the inside that it into the mouth. Finally, that tooth is out. 
It's off to a nice warm bed. It won't be long before Carrie's leaping high in the sky once again. If you're going to keep big cats healthy and happy, you need to understand the way they live, and that means studying them on their own turf. You know these ones, eh? The beasting bush? That just stings horribly. But this one here, that's the, um, the cat thorn. That one grabs you. And if you see a black rhino, it's just either behind a big tree or up a big tree, okay? This is dangerous work. John is on the trail of a leopard. They're the most cunning and elusive of all the big cats. Yeah, generally speaking, one shouldn't track leopard in thick bush like this because they are dangerous animals. Um, and it, it doesn't help to say, well, look, you know, I know this leopard, I know she's not going to do anything. Um, but uh, obviously, if you're going to do something like this, you have to do it very cautiously. The leopard we're tracking is called Cindela. She's been fitted with an internal radio transmitter so John can study her movements. He's monitoring what she's been feeding on. It's all part of getting a better understanding of the ecology of leopard in the Eastern Cape. Okay, we're getting close now. The other hazards with walking through the bush like this after a leopard is that because it's a leopard, it is a dangerous animal. You're always so tuned onto looking, thinking leopard. And next thing you know, you walk around a bush and there's a black rhino and that will be a proverbial nightmare in this bush. Not to mention buffalo. Whoa. Okay, Pumas. And there she is. It's incredible to be this close to a leopard. Okay, now unfortunately I can't see what I came here for is to see if she was on a kill. She definitely looks like she's been feeding. And the other thing is, you know, talking too much sometimes, you're not looking ahead. We almost walked right onto her toes there. Cindela is a very special cat. She was hand-raised as a cub after her mother was killed in a trap. She came to Shamwari three years ago and has been living in the wild ever since. You probably find she's going to be curious about why we're here. Um, as I say, if, if this was a leopard straight from out of an area where they're not used to humans, you'll, you'll find a scenario where she'd either charge us or should uh, or should run away so she's marking herself everywhere scraping looks like she's almost circling us completely yeah, you can see she's got a very full belly she's obviously has got a kill here somewhere and the last thing I want to do is to try and find it while she's in the area because if I get too close to it, that's where she might get aggressive. She comes closer to you, that's a little bit, she's showing comfort. Um, and then when you feel uncomfortable, you just back away a little bit and she seems to acknowledge that as well. Brilliant, that's brilliant. She's very playful at the moment, but we must never ever get complacent. You know, always keep our wits and, and always remember that she is a wild animal. I think it's once, once in a million years you get an animal like this. <laughs> she knows me, I know her. I spend every, every day I spend at least an hour with her, you know, so it's, it's, one of those, um, it's one of those things whereby when she eventually does have her cubs, I'm almost going to feel very proud myself. You know? It's turning into a busy week for big cat doctor Johan Joubert. He's been called to the Born Free Sanctuary at Shamwari, a wildlife centre for abused and neglected big cats rescued from around the world. Here they get a second chance at life, living in large bush enclosures, back in Africa where they belong. Today's patient is a sick lioness called Anthea. She hasn't been eating, and that's a sure sign something is wrong. 
darting is the only way Johan can get close enough to examine her. It's important we get her into the shade so she won't overheat. Just a second, yeah. Anthea has had a hard life. Born Free rescued her and mate Raffi from a tiny cage on top of a restaurant in Tenerife. Both lines were malnourished and frustrated, pacing back and forth all day long. Anthea is about 18 now. That's getting old for a lion. And like most elderly people, things start to break down with age. Okay, she's dehydrated. The heart is a little bit arrhythmia. There's a little arrhythmia. You know, the heart is not beating all that regular. But not a, not a major problem there. We need to get a drip into her and top up those fluids. Now the problem is the veins are now damaged. When an animal is dehydrated, it causes the veins to collapse, making it difficult to get a needle in. It's a worrying time for Claire Bleckensop. She runs the Born Free Centre. Losing this line would be like losing a family member. Anthea will need at least 10 litres of fluid if it's going to make a difference. Now Johan needs to pinpoint what's making her sick. And the best way to do this is a blood test. OK, we have to give the support of treatment now. And support of treatment is basically like vitamins. Remember, we're not sure what the cause of this is. So we give it a bit of uh, vitamins. We give it again an anabolic steroid, to, just to build its muscles up a little bit. And, um, and then some antibiotics in case there's some infection. It doesn't really look like an infectious disease. It more, it, I, I think it's more old age disease. Okay, that's basically it. Anthea really is getting the best of care. Johan has plenty of success stories at Born Free, like these two cubs. Johan, he basically worked miracles with these, with these cats. When they first arrived here, um, they were very, very unsteady on their feet, could hardly walk. Um, Majua, she used to suffer from mini seizures when she got excited or nervous about something. Um, Aki as well, her head used to wobble from side to side um, terribly. But now, basically because of the, the diet that Johan put them on, the care that he gave them, they can now, you can see, uh, they can walk very well. Uh, the wobbling of a key's head has stopped as well. Basically, without him, um, I don't think they would have actually made it. He, he really did work a miracle with them both. Let's hope Anthea will be as lucky as these little fellows. <coughs> Another day, another big cat emergency, and sometimes they don't have happy endings. One of the uh, cheetah cubs is, uh, is sick, um, vomiting, can't get up, um, it's just not doing well. The, the, the problem is, is that uh, the lions are right there as well. Lion and cheetah are age-old enemies. Ecologist John O'Brien has to get there fast. If lions see a cheetah, they'll definitely try and um, it's like eliminating a competition for food um, and especially in this case if they can see that the animal is not 100% if it's been injured um, then, then they'll see a weakness, they see a, a soft spot and, and they'll go for it straight away. So uh, let's just hope we get there in time. But here are the lions that I've been worried about. Prognosis may not be too good on this one. You know, normally in, in, in a natural environment like this, you, you generally leave them, but um, we have a different management philosophy where we, we manage our predators and the predators manage the, uh, the wildlife itself. The cub has already been abandoned by its mother and two sisters. A sure sign in the animal kingdom, something is very wrong. It doesn't even move when it sees John coming. Good. 
it takes just seconds for the cheetah to go down. This animal is so weak, it can't even fight the drug. Yeah, she's, she's definitely sicker than I thought. I mean, she hardly even moved when the dart hit her. It's badly bloated. This is usually an indication of a major infection. There's the problem. A nasty gash on the abdomen. It looks like it's been attacked by those lions. This is a bite mark, eh? Look at that. Yeah. 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 We need to get him to the vet centre as quickly as possible. We're back at the Shamwari Vet Centre to see how our injured cheetah is doing. The news isn't good. Okay, quite sadly, um, this, this cheetah was actually killed by the lions. And the reason for that is the, the lions actually ripped the stomach open. The wound on the outside wasn't very big, so it wasn't all that clear. But um, the lions really got the nails right into its stomach, ripped the stomach open, and obviously all the intestinal fluid came out. So what I think what happened is uh, the cheetah was most probably on a kill and the lion smelled it and they came there and this specific young male was, was too slow to get out of the way. And uh, you just get a flap from the, from the lions and that was it. Quite sad, but unfortunately nothing we can do about that. All big cats are amazing, but some can be just that little bit more special than others. These are rare white lions and they're part of a breeding program Johan is overseeing at Shamwari's sister reserve, Sanborna. Today, Johan needs to break the pride up, and that means taking the parents away from their three cubs. What far with this window? It would be ideal if they could stay together, but mum and dad were hand-raised and have become lazy when it comes to hunting. They're teaching their cubs bad habits, relying on the rangers to feed them. Separating them should encourage That's the little fun. one's natural instincts to kick in. Almost missed him. The first to be darted is one of the cubs. Johan needs yeah. to fit it with a radio collar so he can monitor the youngster's progress once the parents have gone. The cub is going down fast and his siblings sense something is wrong. This could be a problem. Lions will attack family members if they sense a weakness. Luckily, Mum moves in and her very presence is warning enough. The cubs back off. That's one down, two to go. It's time to get the adults loaded. First up is the large male, and he's spectacular. These lions might look albino, but they're not. There's no genetic flaw. They just happen to be white. Now we have to get that radio collar fitted. The team have to be careful. The two brothers are watching from the bushes. These cubs might be young, but they can still do some serious damage. This way, but they. Now it's Mum's turn. Okay. Johan is getting a blood sample. He wants to check the biochemistry of the animal. Make sure the blood cell counts are normal. Like people, lions can get diseases like leukemia, diabetes, and cancer. Okay, that's it. The lions are being placed into a separate enclosure. It will be their home for the next few months. By then, the youngsters should be more independent and have developed their hunting skills. That's when mum and dad will be able to join them again. Getting the breeding program to work is vital, especially when you consider there are no white lions left in the wild in South Africa. Working with big cats doesn't always go according to plan. Johan needs to release a new pride of lions onto Shamwari's sister reserve, Sanborna. 
This enclosure has been their home for the past three months and it's where they feel safe. Fresh meat has been brought in to lure them out. The male will always feed first. The rest of the pride approach cautiously. They won't go to the carcass until the male has finished eating. The last thing they want is to take him on. Little do they realise they have bigger problems to deal with. Our lions have company. There's already another pride on the reserve and they won't take kindly to new arrivals. Our lions are unaware of the danger. Just keep an eye on the reaction of these ones when they eventually see it, but at, at this stage I think they're just more interested in being out than, than keeping their eyes open. The intruder has gone straight for the cub, the most vulnerable member of the group. The male is moving in. Lion fights look and sound far worse than they are. A lion's body is built for battle. Even the heart is in a safe place, under the chin, making it hard to be damaged. The male's shaggy mane is also a great buffer, giving added protection from razor-sharp claws. It's not the ideal case scenario, but um, it's going to happen sooner or later. Be it kilometres from here in the north or south, they're going to have to have their fight to develop their hierarchy. It's the males that will determine the winner. The first to retreat is the loser. The Round one has gone to the established pride. But this is a battle that could go on for days or even weeks. We're back at the Shamwari Vet Centre. Working with big cats is always interesting. You never know what will turn up. Today's patient is a young caracal about five months old. She's being hand raised by foster dad Bruce Little. Bruce found this little girl wandering alone on his property. Her mother was nowhere to be seen. There we go. She really looks still quite lively, eh? Mm, no, she is. They're amazing animals. Just look at those black ear tufts. They're an engineering feat, designed to enhance hearing by helping to direct sound waves, an important tool when hunting. Mm. Okay, can I just quickly listen to her? Sure. This girl still has a lot of growing to do. When she's an adult, she'll be five times this size. Still, she's much bigger than when Johan first examined her. I would say she's a... She's 100%, eh? She's not too fat, she's not too thin. At two weeks old, it was touch and go whether she'd make it. She was so tiny she could fit into a boot and had to be hand-fed constantly. Caracals should be with their mothers for up to a year. No, she's 100% cat, eh? <laughs> She's certainly thriving now, and Bruce plans to get her back to the bush, where all wild animals should be. <laughs> the big cats at Shamwari really do get the very best of care, from the biggest to the smallest problems. Murray Stocko has just joined the Shamwari vet team. And his first job today is to dart and sedate a lioness at the Born Free Centre. It looks like she has an eye infection. 
But first, he has to get close enough to dart her. She is in a hospital enclosure, so I am able to get close enough to her to be able to dart, but hopefully she'll be able to just sit still for me for long enough to be able to dart her. Majur is very wary of people, and she has good reason to be. When she was rescued four years ago, she was suffering from terrible malnutrition, and this led to a breakdown in her muscles. She's walking a lot better now, but she still bears the emotional scars from her mistreatment. When they were fed initially, they weren't fed the right ratio of calcium and phosphorus, so basically the calcium and phosphorus ratios have been all mixed up, so that's why they've got basically chemical imbalances. She's close to the fence. It's the perfect spot to get off a shot. The dart good again. Unfortunately, the dart has come out again. It has been released, but I didn't see it spray or anything like that. Should between, take between five and 10 minutes for and then she'll fall into deep sleep. The team are moving in. They have to act quickly. The less time Majur is sedated, the faster her recovery will be. Quite awake. But we won't be too long, so we'll just be quick. We're just trying to have a good look at our eyes. You see a conjunctiva here is quite inflamed. Just trying to check that there's no growth or anything like that. You can just see the redness here, which is quite inflamed. Um, it has been quite hot and dry lately with a lot of dust and things around so it could just be a bit of irritation and things like that that have set it off. But for the time being I'm just going to basically put some eye drops into her. Unfortunately it's not, you know, it's eye drops we'd like to treat her every day with but I'm just going to put quite a few eye drops in and see how we do and hopefully actually her own immune system will treat it more than actually me. But at least now we know that there's nothing surgically we can do and it's nothing too serious, so she'll be able to look after herself in the intervention. Managing big cats on a reserve can be a lot of hard work especially if they think the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. Uh, there is no such thing as a leopard-proof fence. They, they, they're too clever for that. They're too agile. Uh, they climb fences, they jump over, they, they climb underneath. Um, leopards have even been known to claw their way over an electric fence. That's exactly what's happened. A male leopard has escaped into a neighbouring farm, and that means trouble. Leopards are hoarders, and when they hunt, they can kill up to six animals in one night. John has to get the leopard back and fast. Luckily, it's fitted with a radio collar for emergencies just like this. But if you look, you can see this could have been where the, the leopard jumped, avoiding the electric strands, getting onto the section between the electric strands and then through. And there he is, hiding in the thicket. It's too dense for John to get a clean shot at darting him. The only option is to trap the leopard. This is what you call a cage trap. It's, it's, it's far more effective than, and, and humane than, than some of the other methods that people use to catch leopard. Um, it works on the principle where you've got a bait right at the back, an opening on the fence line, or it could be anywhere, you know, in the bush, but we've used the fence line because hopefully we, the leopard will walk down and we'll track it through here. And it's got a, a springboard in front when it comes to get the bait, which then sets off the, um, the door, which closes behind it. Now it's up to our leopard to take the bait. This will be a waiting game. Back at the Shamwari Vet Centre, big cat doctor Johan Joubert has double trouble with the born free lions. Rafi, Anthea's mate, has taken a turn for the worse. He's stopped eating and is lethargic. 
Anthea also appears to be on a downhill slide. Just take the two poles out, that's all. Both lions are severely dehydrated and Johan needs to get a drip into them. There's a lot of roaring going on. And that's because our lions aren't fully sedated. The lighter the tranquilizer, the less side effects they'll have when they wake up. Anthea's blood results have come back and they confirm Johan's diagnosis of old age problems. John, can, we, please, can we just have a little bit of that paper there to swap this blood with, please? There's nothing specific, but the blood cell count is down, indicating the organs are not functioning at 100%. Rafi is also suffering from old age, and he's a regular visitor to the vet centre. Okay. We know Rafi's got a problem with his kidneys, so we're just going to do a little strip test to see how bad it is. Uh, so we're going to take a little bit of blood. Okay. The chemicals on the paper register the amount of urea in the blood. Urea should be excreted by the kidneys, so if the level is a bit high, then it indicates the kidneys aren't functioning properly. The yellow is turning blue. It's not a good sign. Liver disease is breaking down Rafi's body. The best Johan can do is give the lions a dose of anabolic steroids to help build their body condition and maintain their quality of life. Once they start to feel pain, Johan will put them to sleep. It's the kindest thing to do. For now, they'll continue to live out their days together in peace and comfort. It's the call John had been hoping for. Our escaped leopard has taken the bait. That, uh, that leopard now after four days is finally coming to the trap. So, uh, Johan got there first. He's already tranquilized the animal, so we need to get there as quick as possible so we can get him out of there. It's good news, but the weather is far from ideal. Uh, it'll make a little wet, uh, cold, um, and of course, <laughs> there's the roads to contend with as well, which is another issue altogether. There he is. All John's hard work has paid off. Johan just topped up the sedative. A fully alert leopard in a cage would stress far too much. It needs to stay calm or it will injure itself. This leopard is getting cold. We need to get it undercover as quickly as possible. Johan is giving it a good rub down. He has to get this animal dry and warm or else hypothermia will set in. It's shaking for the cold, but also because it's coming around now because it's, uh, we'll have to top up the anesthetic just now. Because... Our leopard might be cold, but at least he isn't injured. You can see just how effective those traps are. They're the most humane way of catching a cat. Finally, a quick shot of antibiotics will help stop this leopard coming down with pneumonia. The next morning, and John is releasing the leopard back onto the reserve. But first, it needs to spend some time in a smaller enclosure. It has to learn all over again, electric fences mean danger. It's starting to wake up, and he won't be in a good mood. He's, 
he's coming around very quickly now. He'll be he'll be around in about half an hour, which is brilliant because um, when when they anaesthetize, they can't regulate their body temperatures. You know, if it's too hot or too cold, they can actually die from that. So we don't like to have them too heavily anaesthetized when we put them in the bomas. It doesn't look the best. You know, he's falling around a bit. He's trying to get his, his muscle coordination back again. But uh, he should be around by this afternoon nicely. If only this leopard realised Shamwari is a safe haven and the grass really is much greener on this side of the fence. If he leaves the reserve again, he might not be so lucky. We must try and get, uh, get close enough to her that we can see, see whether she eat and, uh, and see whether she's dehydrated. It might be a little bit difficult to see that. Eh? Okay. I know, yes, she is right here. Eh? Oh, great. Okay, she doesn't like me, so let's rather stop right here. <sighs> Johan is back at the Bourne Free Centre to check how our lions are doing. Anthea has seen him and gone straight for the bushes. She knows the last time he was here, she ended up with a dart in her. A bit of meat should lure her out. Come, go. Anthea. Anthea. OK, she's definitely dehydrated, but she's still quite interested in the food, eh? Do you think it's old age? Or? I think old age is the, the biggest problem. You know, with the previous test we did, there was nothing very specific. Mm. You know, not that you can say the kidneys are failing or the liver, mm. but everything is just basically a little bit down. Yeah. So that but, would indicate mm, just. But obviously, the fact that she's getting dehydrated without a diarrhea, yeah. most probably chronic kidney disease as well. But but we'll have to see. Okay. You can see there she's not really eating. Eh? She's no. moving. She's moving out. She just took her food and she's moving. She's, she's definitely not well. Things may not be looking too good for Rafi and Anthea. If they start suffering from too much pain, then Johan will put them to sleep. Darting the lions for constant treatment is causing them just too much stress. Okay, great. Okay. Working with big cats might be dangerous, but it also has its rewards. Remember the female Johan fitted with a radio transmitter? Well, she's been located, and so have her cubs. They're young, eh? Some off them. The youngsters have just started leaving the den. Like kittens, their eyes are closed when they're born and it takes some time for them to develop. Normally when a female has cubs, uh, she hides them, you know, in a thick bush or something like that. Um, and generally we'll, we'll start bringing them around at about uh, four to six weeks or start exposing them to the world as such. That means they're better equipped to handle any problems their trip into the wild might pose. At this age, these cubs are quite vulnerable. You can see they're still quite, uh, quite small and uh, they're very dependent on the mother. So if they're on their own, anything can happen to them. A hyena can get hold of them, even other lions. Uh, there's always the, the chance of injuries. We know there's lots of snakes around here. Uh, so there's many things that can go wrong with them. But most of the cubs survive quite well. Danger seems to be the last thing on these cubs' minds. They're too busy having fun. You can see if you look at that, uh, that playful behaviour there, it's, it's, it's almost like in between playing and fighting and, uh, and hunting, you can see they always go for each other's throat and be interested in the mother's tail and anything that moves get their attention, so that's the way they live. Playing also creates a strong bond between siblings. This is important as when they get older they'll need to work together to hunt. I wonder how long it will be before mom gets a bit irritated. Well, at the moment it seems she's, she's, uh, she's taking quite well. Mm. But she's always been a good mother. Uh, this is her, her uh, third, third litter as far as uh, we know. Eh? For Johan and John, 
This is what makes working with big cats so special. They've done their bit to help with big cat conservation in Africa. It's time for an update on all our big cat patients. The cheetah mum that lost her cub to the lions is doing well, and so are her remaining youngsters. They're staying well away from the lions. Sadly, Anthea and Raffi didn't make it. The kindest thing to do was to put them to sleep. Their old age problems were causing just too much pain. Carrie the caracal is a lot happier now her tooth has been fixed. The fighting lions of Zamborna have established their dominance and marked out their territory without too much injury. And our male leopard has stopped straying. He must have realised that a big cat doctor never too far away, the grass really is far greener at Shamwari.